Welcome to Landscape Photography World, a podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne, I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This week I'm talking to Slater Lemley about his work and methods. After travelling and living across the US, Slater now calls North Carolina home. He's self-taught with a passion for all things photography, open spaces, grandiose landscapes and kind people. His work has allowed him to travel often and experience many amazing parts of our world. We discuss how he got started in photography, how his style has developed and his passion for film photography. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi Slater, welcome to uh, Landscape Photography World. Good to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really pleased you uh, said yes. I've uh, seen a bit of your work around and uh, I was very happy when you said yes to uh, coming on because uh, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about. Uh, but before we get to some of those, tell me about how you got started with photography and landscape photography in particular. So I actually did an internship in business school in college and they had you had to choose a local business basically to work for and i chose a local coffee shop or sorry local camera shop oh my gosh and uh <laughs> a bit of a bit so, of a difference <laughs> uh, yeah i worked at a coffee shop at the same time so <laughs> got get them confused but uh so i did this internship and all i thought it was going to be was learning the ins and outs of just being a small business mm -hmm. but i actually kind of fell in love with the process of photography and photo gear while I was working there. So this is when I started it, the Canon 80D was just released. So it was yep. like the hottest item. And uh, so actually, <clears throat> because it's like, oh, wow, this is the best camera right now. Uh, that's where I started. And uh, so I was using this Canon 80D, just shooting my friends, shooting around college campus. Uh, trying to get a couple paid jobs here and there and uh but i was in iowa and uh -huh. in, i don't know if you know you don't i don't know if you know a lot about iowa but i've never been not there, exactly I it's really flat yeah it's it's not the worst place in the united states for landscape photos but it's not up there in the high ranks of like yeah, no, being a good place for location not, it's not colorado or uh, arizona yeah. or <laughs> utah exactly so I didn't really get exposed to landscape work until I actually moved after graduating college. I moved to Michigan and uh, I don't know if you know about Michigan, but the fall color changes yep. are incredible. And you have Lake Michigan on one side and you have the Detroit River and Canada on the other side. So yep. Yep. you the whole state is just kind of a breeding ground for kind of good landscapes, but it's still not this grandiose spot yeah yeah but then uh after a couple of years in detroit i moved to colorado and in colorado that's where i really dove into landscapes and nature yeah. from there sure okay so what got you hooked i guess on on that landscape what is what it is about the landscape and particularly the landscape let's say of colorado that uh Got, got you going i think the the part that really like caught my eye initially was living in colorado the people you meet and the people you know are already taking photos of kind of the best spots around the state mm -hmm. and you see those photos and you're like i wonder what that would look like if i took that photo instead of their perspective yeah and so you travel to the same places because i mean at this point every amazing spot is known there you aren't no one's discovering new yeah, you've re really got to go very back country if you're uh yeah if, if and i'm not that, much of a one. hiker yeah <laughs> like I'll, I'll do short hikes definitely to get to spots but i'm not i don't want to do 60 miles yeah to yeah. to discover something new and so i was seeing all of my other friends photos and thinking man if i were there i think i could do it better and I know that sounds kind of like being a jerk about it, but they weren't professionals and yeah, yeah. they were getting these amazing photos. So I was like, oh man, like I've been doing this for a while. How good of a photo could I take? 
And so I would travel to these spots and I would see ju- like just looking, not through my lens, not through mm-hmm. anything, just looking at the landscape and think, well, this is incredible. And you would, I would stand there for tens of tw- dozens of minutes and just think of like how many people have been to this spot and how many people have seen the same view as me. How can I capture that in a way that won't feel either disingenuous or feel like the same thing everyone's seen? Sure. Uh, so I would, with without really, I, I'm not much with going off trail, especially in the U.S. There, we, we have a lot of rules and guidelines and yeah, yeah. Uh, parks here, and, and to not like trailblaze through, uh, like off the marked path, basically. And so within those limitations of the trail, I try to find some type of new perspective on the photo, whether that be finding reflections that might not be normally made. So like finding a random puddle that could serve as a reflection point or even just like waiting during different times of day than you'd normally see a specific spot. Like maybe a spot is really, really famous for sunrise. Let's see what that looks like for sunset. Yeah. And, or even just midday, maybe the harsh lighting will turn out well with that. And so with that, those thoughts of like, can I take a better photo? I was experimenting with more uh, kind of diverse options for each spot. And I think coming out with photos that I was really proud of. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So how would you describe your style? What, uh, you know, do, do you have a style or do you, you know, that you particularly aim for or not? So I, I've definitely changed over the years. Mm. Um, when I was living in Colorado, when I first moved out there, I was like, let's take the crispest, like sharpest photo possible. Yep. Uh, let's try to use the best gear. Uh, I'll, I'll go pay for a rental if I really want a specific lens uh to shoot a scene and now i don't follow those rules at all um i think as i've moved toward film photography over the last three years uh the concept of sharpness has kind of moved toward the concept of having a good feel and by feel i kind of mean just like an evenness to the photo where Like you feel kind of more in the spot than like, wow, that flower is really in focus or like you can really see those mountain peaks. If I zoom in, I can see like how the pixels are perfect and everything. Um, So my styles, it kind of evolved into let's try to make the colors match more than have like a great looking image. Like maybe I'll change up the perspective so I can have the colors fit themselves better because film kind of treat, you can treat film better that way by having an even exposure and having similar colors. Yep. But yeah, so I think uh, I search for a lot of pastel colors because they, they work well together, even if they aren't, in the same kind of color family or in the, like in typically working parts of the color wheel. Whereas like when I was doing really crisp digital photography, I was like, okay, I need the colors to like fit perfectly on the spectrum. If this, if the color's here on the wheel, I need the other color to be here. And like, I would never move outside of that. Yeah. 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 And, and that's where people got the, the orange and teal situation Uh from. Yeah. And, you can take probably the top thousand Instagram posts from 2015 and you'd find that almost every single one of them had that color relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to be very influenced by cinema, et cetera. Yeah. The time. Yeah. 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 And you know, in the art world, that's not a bad thing to, to want to fit because the, those colors work for a reason. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I finding the new relationships between colors that might not typically be known to work with each other has been like a real driving force in what I look for in photos now. Cool, cool. So 
why film? Uh, the, this is this is one of the things that I want to want to explore with you. You know, so I mean, I I started with film way back when film was all you could do. Yeah. <laughs> Simply because I had no choice, um, <laughs> and and somebody gave me a camera, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you know, for a uh, you know young man, I guess you know, in in relationship to myself, you know, I'm well into my <laughs> you know. But uh, for a young young bloke that's out there trying to take photography, why film? What 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 is it about film that uh, you know? You know, a lot of people draws you to it. A lot of people will tell you that film forces them to slow down. Uh, it makes them consider each shot more effectively because you, if you're shooting medium format, you might have 12 shots per roll. Yep. And you're like, wow, each shot is $3. Like, okay. Or if, if you're developing and scanning or paying people to do that, uh, plus the cost of film, you're... It's like, oh my gosh, if I mess this shot up, I'm out $2 and yeah. I don't want to do that. So I think the process of slowing it down was really good for me because definitely in the landscape world, I was like, if I take a hundred photos today, three or four of them are probably going to be good. And now with film, it's like, okay, if I really dedicate myself to this, hopefully every shot on this roll is good. Mm. And and then you, because there is that added cost, you aren't maybe taking the photos that might be good. You're taking the ones where you're like, I love how this looks and yep. I want to capture it. Got it. So you're not weeding through like hundreds and thousands of photos. You know, when I was, when I first started and I was using that ADD, I was taking 1200 photos on a hike. Wow. And yeah, and just ridiculous amounts of photos. And it's like, were any of them good? No, maybe one, maybe two. Yeah, yeah. And, but then, but at the time, it's like, spray and pray. Hopefully, something good will come out of this. And now that I've definitely developed a skill, slowing down has been really good for me. But I think the other part of film that really draws me is having full control over the entire process, including printing. So you you buy the specific specific film that you want to use. Mm -hmm. You have to source a film camera, which is not the easiest thing to do nowadays, yeah, especially yeah. if you're looking into the pro level gear. Yeah. Now, like five years ago, uh, a regular Canon AE1, like kind of a workhorse camera, you can get them for 60 bucks, 50 bucks. Yes. Now I'm seeing people sell Canon A1s for 350, 400 dollars. Yeah, just five years later. Probably the retail back in uh, 1980 or 85 exactly. or whatever it was when it was out. Ah, <laughs> uh, and that that difference is even bigger in the medium format and large format world. You see people like a Pentax 67, even last year was 600 dollars. Wow. And this year they're 1300 dollars. Yeah. Like. And so it's like you go through, you have to go through the process of actually sourcing the physical unit to take the photo with now. It's not like you can just go on Amazon or go on uh, B&H and just be like, I want the Nikon Z6. Uh, but so that part, like finding the film that you like, looking at different people's photos with that film, finding a camera, and then you can start taking photos. And yeah. then... You'll take the photos and now you're like, okay, do I develop this myself or do I pay someone to do it? Mm. And at the beginning, you're like, I'm just going to pay someone to do it. I have no skill in developing. Yep. So, so then as time goes, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but as time goes on, you're like, man, I'm spending five bucks to get this developed and nine dollars to get it scanned every yep. time, if not more. And it's like, man, if I really want to dedicate myself to this, I need to learn how to do this myself. Sure. And so up until recently, I was still paying for development, maybe from better developers than like a typical lab. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a friend, Emily Swift, who owns runs her own film lab. Yep. Um, I've, I've sent stuff to her before and she has done amazing color grading on my work. But now that I'm fully into film photography, 
I want more control. I want to be able to push my film myself, like look at my notes that I have taken and be like, okay, I want to push it half a step just because I might have underexposed a little bit. Yep. And when you're using a service to develop your film, not a lot of them are willing to do those extra things. Yeah. Uh, because they're doing big batches with other people's film. Yeah, they don't they don't have the time to play with it and exactly do, and, do a uh, special for you. Yeah. And so all those things made me start trying to develop on my own. I'm still not great at it. And I think it'll just come with time as the rest of photography kind of did for me. Now, I never had any official training on any subject of photography. So it's kind of just been trial and error in my whole life. Yeah. And then uh, and then with scanning, you're opening up this world of like what scanner programs and what scanners are going to do the best for me. And then you can edit. And uh, there's a big debate as if you should edit film. And I'll edit it. I, if depending upon the scanner you use, you'll get different results, different colors, or and even with different programs on the same scanner. Yeah. So I have no shame in the fact saying that like I will color grade my film. Right. Because the point of the film is not to get the specific colors that develop it. It's the point of it is to just do photography, and it just happens to be on film. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that <laughs> makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. So uh, all of that together is kind of why I like shooting film. You have full control over each step. Like you might find better results from a camera from 1960 than a mm -hmm. camera from 2010. And just all of those together just made me fall in love with that as a medium a lot more than digital photography. Plus with digital, I feel like if I'm not keeping up with the latest gear, I'm falling behind. Wow. Whereas with film, it feels more of an art form. So it's like my skill affects the outcome a lot more than with digital. Yeah, right. So, that's, yeah. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's interesting. I guess, you know, it, it sounds like you, you're trying to be artistic with your photography. Um, I guess, is that working for you or are you struggling with that or is it just something that you find comes naturally? I think I always was looking for an outlet for some type of art because I, I've never been good at drawing, never been good at painting. I've I tried ceramics, which I was okay at. I took two classes in high school. So I never had an outlet for real art mm. until I started doing photography. And even at the beginning, I wouldn't call what I was doing art. I would call it I, using technology. I don't, I'm not sure <laughs> if what I was doing was actually photography at that point. Sure. Okay. Uh, at that point, I was totally just clicking a button. You know, like they say, uh, oh, why would I? pay you a ton to do this job you're just <laughs> clicking a button well that's what i was doing yeah. i was not any good and so now with film and kind of dedicating things to be more artistic it's become this great outlet for me that i because i never had anything like that and i'll never be good at drawing but i th i think i'm good at photography yeah. so <laughs> Well, it sounds, it sounds like you've got a particular approach to photography, I guess, as it relates to experience and how that can sort of transcend to art as opposed to, as you said, you know, just clicking a button, you know, which, yeah, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people joke about, you know, but, but you know, to be honest, it, it, it is a concept that is out there that, you know, people think, oh, and particularly with, uh, you know, phone photography now, you know, mm -hmm. where... You know, I, you look at the, the the Google Pixel, whatever it is yeah. now. You know where you can <laughs> put motion blur in and you know remove motion blur from faces and all that sort of thing. You know, and it to me that 
that's less art and, as you said, more technology. And now I, I don't want to discredit anyone uh, who's using digital. And I'm, I, I'm, yeah, you're yeah. not saying that either. Yeah. But as I've transitioned to shooting film as a, I would say I'm about 50-50 digital and film now. Uh -huh. I like as I'm sourcing more film gear, I'm like slowly transitioning to only film. But yeah. I guess I'll, I would always keep digital as a backup if I were doing work. Um, I have done a few paid gigs for film now. Uh, I, I was always hesitant to do paid gigs on film because I, the thought of just messing up was always in my head. Oh. Like if I, if the shot only happens one, like a wedding, if this shot happens once. Yeah. You miss it on I'm, film. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and so it's like, okay, I'll, I, out of necessity as someone doing the job, I will need to have digital. Yeah. Right. But, um, but yeah, uh, the, the new phones, it's just insanity with how good of a photo you can even take. Oh yeah, uh, I mean, you you look at some astrophotography <laughs> now that's coming out, from, you know, a phone. I I saw someone put their phone on a tripod while I was shooting on a tripod, and they captured a photo close to what I was doing. Yeah, and I was using like I I think at that time I was using like a Canon, like a six D two or something like uh -huh. that. And I saw, yeah. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah. Like. <laughs> this camera was sixteen hundred dollars, and the lens was another twelve hundred, and you're just using your phone that you would already have. Yeah. And, oh, I was like, I, <laughs> you got to hold back the jealousy on that because it's like, oh, I've like I worked hard to like develop the skill to do this, and uh, now there's a program that will just do it for them on their phones, mm -hmm. and you have this on your mind. You're like, oh my gosh. Is my skill set not going to be like viable? Yeah, is AI a going to years? replace the photographer? Yeah. yeah, and you know, uh, Photoshop actually released a bunch of like I wouldn't call them filter. Oh, they might be filters that will make a photo look like you took it in the winter or look oh, like the, the neural the, the neural filters feature. Yeah, and yeah, and I saw that I was like, oh my gosh someone will just be able to go shoot a location one time, do it really well that one time, yep. apply the four different seasons of filters, and then they'll have four wildly different photos of the same location, but during different seasons. And no one would be the wiser unless you're, you've been to those spots yourself. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> but when I shoot film, I, you can't really fake that. No. So I think there's like another, like, like shooting film, there's like a genuine side to it even. Like if you shot this on a film camera, that's probably what it looked like. Yeah. And uh, aside from some color grading. Yeah. Because I and like, really you know, like. It, as long as you nail the exposure focus and all the, all the technical aspects, you know. Yeah. And I think most of what I say is kind of assuming that you have, because I've shot some film awfully before. I've, mm. Oh, I've everyone had whole has. rolls and oh yeah, <laughs> I've I've shot like ten rolls with a camera without getting them developed one time, and then I realized that the camera was not working. It was not the shutter was not firing. It was just making a noise, and I thought the shutter was going. Oh wow! <laughs> and so I had ten full rolls of blank film from this camera. No, nice. <laughs> I was like, I just wasted. A hundred and forty dollars to find out that like these th this camera's bad. The yeah, shutter's <laughs> not not working. Wow. Right. So what uh, are you doing? Anything particular that you would say would be different to others? And if so, what what is what is it that you're doing, and why do you do it? So I've been really experimenting with pre sunrise and post sunset uh photography because excuse me uh, i've been finding that the colors that i search out and the scenes that i like to shoot now i live on the beach now by the way in north 
in North Carolina. And so like I'm on the East coast and the sun will rise perfectly perpendicular with the beach. Mm -hmm. So I'll get the, this direct light as soon as the sun comes up that like hits the beach, but I don't want that direct light. I like the, the sky still being lit up, but the foreground being this kind of muted blue. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so I've been, if, if, there was ever a thing that I would call a style that I shoot now. It is definitely a, a more blue form of photography. Uh, I, everyone loves golden hour. They, like, and I still do like having those nice bright oranges and yellows and the shadows yeah. are perfect, but the, the blues and purples and reds that come out, um, just before the sun rises and just after it sets, those are what I seek out now. Now that's the least convenient times for me to be shooting photography because I have to be up at six in the morning, five 30 in the morning, if I want to shoot sunrise yep, yep. and here on the East coast, the sun sets before I'm off work. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, like <clears throat> at right now it's hard to shoot that style. If I don't want to like make my whole day, bad <laughs> make myself <laughs> tired in the morning or try to sneak out of work early uh but so i've been really really diving deep into how to capture these like deep colors with old technology that's really not that great at capturing light yeah, not no. not really designed for blue hour photography per se yeah yeah i have a i've had a couple of photos do pretty well on social media and I, i've been it's, i've been having a hard time with it but like trying not to judge how good my photos and my art are mm. by like the engagement they get but sometimes engagement is just confirmation that i did take a good photo yeah yeah and uh so i've had a couple of these photos that have like really tried hard to make uh with the blues and the purples do very well at least by my standards. And if there was any like confirmation that I was doing the right thing in my style and that's like something that I want to keep doing was that engagement. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, definitely the blues and the purples. Like I'm just thinking of right now, like roles that I've shot that I haven't developed yet. Sure. That, like I have cer certain shots on that. I'm like, oh, I really hope that turned out. Yeah. I, and, and to be honest, you know, having come from that back in the, uh, you know, the 70s and 80s when I sort of was working with film and and uh, into the 90s, that anticipation because you couldn't look at the back of the camera because yeah. all I've got, on, you know, all I ever had on the back of the camera was your, your, um, your, your, your film card. Your film card. Yeah. <laughs> your conversion table so you know <laughs> oh <laughs> i i usually stick the uh the box like the label on the box oh, yeah, into yeah. The, my little back holder mm -hmm. because especially if i'm shooting a roll of 36 on like some 35 millimeter i will forget what i'm shooting yeah because like i said I, I try to take it slow sometimes a roll will take me multiple days maybe even a week of shooting yeah Yep. And uh, now I've started shooting more medium format, so that's <laughs> changed a little bit. Cool. Uh, I shot a, a roll on a six by nine uh, camera and I was like, oh, wait, six shots and I'm done. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, I was a little disappointed in that one. I, I thought I had a few more to go. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I remember when 30, 36 shot 35 mil came out where you could actually get 36 shots on a single roll. And that, that was amazing because yes, you could shoot for weeks with, yeah. without developing. It. <laughs> and I actually have a, a half frame camera so okay. I can turn that the 36 into 72. Nice. And uh, with modern scanners, it's like the, the photo will be good enough for social media or a small print. So it's like, Oh wow. 72 exposures. Yeah. Uh, per roll, this is maybe starting to become back in my budget again. 
Yeah, it does does make a difference. So have you have you experimented uh, even further? You know, you hear about people developing their film in coffee and soup and all film kinds soup. of other unusual liquids. <laughs> uh, I've done. I've, so I've, I have a couple of friends who will soup film for people, uh-huh. and I had them do Dawn dish soap and lemon juice i think it was a citrus juice yep and uh i didn't like it i was not the biggest fan because i was like oh man some of these shots might have been really good if i would have just done just like normal developing and you know i've actually shot some of the there's like uh oh gosh it's like joke film it like it's just different styles of uh like i think double film does it oh gosh there's a couple of brands that make like weird film yeah oh yeah and i like i said earlier i forget sometimes what roles i'm shooting Mm -hmm. and so i took this neon pink film uh or that was what was in my camera and i just did not remember and i shot part of an event with this film and I thought I maybe had like eight exposures on it. And I took the like roll. It was on a, that was a point and shoot. And uh-huh. so the roll finished uh, reeling itself back in and I popped back open. I, I look at the film that's in there and I was like, Oh no. Like <laughs> I, I ruined the first 30 minutes of this event for uh-huh. like what I'm being paid to document. And I look at those photos now and I'm just like, what was I ever thinking buying joke film when I could just do the joke stuff in post? Well, like, that's it. Yeah. If you want neon pink, you can just put a put a filter on there. Yeah. <laughs> now I have seen some amazing work by people who do souped film. Yeah. Uh, there's this one photographer, I think her name's Lindsay. Lindsay Marie on Twitter. Okay. something like that and she does souped film all the time for herself and for other people yeah and i think she has this one in the works that i'm super excited to see where she did s- seawater and okay. seaweed and sand wow and like everything you could find at the beach basically and uh i want to see like how the salt uh affects yeah. the the film because she's had some wild turnouts for the things that she's used to suit film but uh so i make i like when other people do it i'm not a big fan of doing it myself yeah sure yeah yeah i mean it's something i've i mean i've I've never really done uh myself so i'm I'm just interested to know what uh what people think about you know the, the the process and everything and uh why 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 you would get into that and i i understand you know it's the experimentation it's really just you know let's let's see what happens you know and i you know i've seen i love that part of it you know (laughs) yeah and it you could almost call that more of an art form than maybe like i uh, let me i'll take a step back i will never say that any type of photography is not art yep but when you are taking it a step further in kind of making it your own, it kind of becomes more of an art because Mm -hmm. you are adding your own personal touch to it. And so I've seen some incredible results by people using like the joke film I was talking about where they did like a portrait session in the studio. So they had a really controlled environment with actual studio lights and the like they could use shorter exposures because they had these real bright scenes and so you're you're not seeing the effects of the joke as much because there's more normal like just light hitting the film like white light that will kind of drown out a little bit of the joke and bring out like a good amount of just normal photo and with the joke added some of them is like it looks like not a spider web but maybe like uh have you seen like bubble suds yeah yeah like across i've seen some portraits done on like a joke film that had kind of like a sudsy look and the way it turned out is like the subject's eyes 
were like perfectly between some of the suds on some of the shots and like yeah. maybe just their mouth was seen through the joke part and it's like wow this looks like someone could have just done this as a painting idea yeah. let alone use this all like for all intents and purposes joke film and so i i will i see people making incredible stuff um i don't i just don't think i'm there yet yeah fair enough <laughs> i mean that that sort of stuff is always going to be fairly unique do you find the images you're making are distinctive or unique distinctive being recognizable i guess in a genre versus being one of a kind in the world i think up until maybe a year a year and a half ago my photos could have been taken by anyone who had like a direct skill set in photography and anyone who would have traveled to the locations i was going to and mm -hmm. i think that is that's a hard thing especially for landscape photographers because if someone just as skilled as you goes to the same place, they'll probably be able to get the same photo. It's like tough, it's like tough to think that way. What would, like what was the original question that you I asked? I guess do you, do, you, do you find the images you're making, are you trying to make them distinctive oh. or trying to make them unique? So, uh, yeah, up until that point, I was not trying to be super unique. I was just trying to take the best photo possible mm -hmm. and now i think and it, it depends on what i'm shooting because i'll still shoot product photos for businesses i'll still yep. do events and stuff and it's hard to have like a real style in yeah. that type of photography and, now, and the with, customer's always going to want what they want yeah exactly yeah a lot of times and i i live in a really small town out here i think for a total number of year-round residents here on the outer banks is about thirty thousand people wow. and so there's not a lot of people looking for like real artistic insights or you know even typical director of photography uh work out here they want like hey i sell these products can you go take some photos of them on the beach and that's all like they're really yeah. thinking and I won't downplay them for doing that because it works. Obviously, that marketing style has worked for them for decades. Absolutely. Um, and so you can't knock the fact that things work. Um, but so in my own personal work, you can I think you can definitely tell, like, oh, I maybe not, oh, this is done by Slater, but you could tell, like, oh, this is done by someone who's like really dedicating thought into the the work the piece yep and i think i will find that like in my personal opinion of like will i have i found success the moment someone will be able to look at a photo and think that was done by slater mm -hmm. I, I think that's when i will feel successful because sure. right now i don't feel like i've really hit my stride in like being this great artist or anything yeah so i think i'm working toward a style but i don't have it down yet if that yep. makes sense yep no that, that that makes a lot of sense and i think you know a lot of a lot of artists and uh photographers go through that process of you know understanding you know there's obviously starting off with all the technical aspects of understanding how to develop that style but you get into mm -hmm. that point where okay yeah i can start to see how the the style is developing and then you can start to direct it in a particular way you know and i think that's yeah if, if you can get to that point that's when you can really start to i guess transcend from you know pure photo photography as a as an experience so here's a shot of this mountain you know i was here mm -hmm. these were the conditions the light was fantastic whatever you know yeah to okay i, I added a little bit of warmth to make yeah. it feel like it was like <laughs> to where oh that's a that that's a slater or that's a a, a swinborne or you know whatever you know <laughs> yeah and uh it, you and i 
I think we kind of met through Twitter, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, there are some people in the photo space on Twitter where I will look at a photo and be like, that's a Briscoe. That yep. is like, that is a Joey. That like, you can, and you can see that their style has come through and they've, because they've been working hard on it and basically like thinking through and doing everything they can to fit what they want and what they want turns into the style. Yeah. And uh, I think I've been thinking about this a lot lately in that traditional artists, you know, painters, drawers, uh, it, people that come from mediums that require like thought into the process of art mm -hmm. have a leg up coming into the photo world because they only really have to learn the technical stuff now. Mm, they have yeah. the thought of art down in their heads. And now it's just a matter of learning what aperture is, learning what shutter speed does. And that's it. And they just so, got to push a button. <laughs> yeah, at that point, they just need to push the button. <laughs> but uh, there's something to be said to be able to look at something and just go, wow i know exactly who made this i love it and i'm so happy that they made it and they're in the photo world there's copycats out there yeah, yeah. i think in in the painting world you can painters like especially very skilled ones can copy something to the exact painting they can yeah. literally just replicate it but in the photo world there's just that little bit like maybe the original photographer shot it at 60 millimeters mm. and the person who went to the same place and tried to shoot the same thing in the same conditions shot it at 45. Yeah. But you can like that little difference is what made you think like, Oh, that is a slider. Yeah. Like yeah. that little difference is what makes it. And I think that replication is a lot harder in the photo world than in the traditional art world. Yeah, well, I mean, there, you know, there, there's some places, uh, you know, the the iconic ones which are always going to be iconic. But you know, it's it's kind of like the, the the Sydney Opera House, say here here where I live, right? There's only so many places you can shoot it from, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you want a long exposure. You know, you, you because yeah. it's right on the harbour, <laughs> long exposure on a boat, it's not going to work. You know? Yeah. Um, and uh, I've always wanted to shoot the Sydney Opera House, but now that I've been on social media for years, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of photos. Yep. Of I've, I've taken most of them. <laughs> 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 but that's like it. There are a lot, a lot of talented photographers that live in New York City. Yeah. And at this point, landscape photos in New York City aren't as enjoyable. Because there's so many of them. Yeah. And there's only so many ways you can shoot the skyscrapers, just like the Sydney Opera House. And that's a problem for tons of landscape photographers, especially as the barrier for entry of getting into photography has decreased. That, that because... said, though, I, I, I think it ha has another effect for those that are really creative, and that is that it it stretches your creative thinking around, okay, this shot has been done, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of times, you know, and mm -hmm. to varying levels of skill. But, you know, the really good ones, there's only a few, and that's where you go, okay, well, I'm not going to, you know, let, let's say it, it is the Sydney Opera House, I'm not going to do that traditional, I want the whole thing with a nice sunrise or whatever behind it. I'm going to focus mm -hmm. just on the windows at the front or I'm going to focus just on the tiles on one of the sails, let alone mm -hmm. you know, two or three of the sails. Yeah. And uh, at, the Opera House is definitely like, its own unique thing because it is such a recognisable Mm. building or structure just in general that I, people without any knowledge of australia at all might be able to look at a photo of it and be like oh it's a sydney opera house yeah whereas like with landscape work in like nature especially yeah. you could go 
into the mountains of Colorado or Washington, Mm -hmm. and you could still shoot a famous spot, but people won't be able to be like, yeah, yeah, especially if they're from other places. And I think that's one of the beauties of what social media has done for photographers is like, it used to be if, if you took photos, those photos would not leave the circles around the people within your kind of biome, like within 50 miles of you. Yeah. But now you'll be able to take these photos. Like maybe people live in Utah and they go out to Moab and they go to Arches National Park here. Yep. And if you're from Moab, if Arches is no longer this like magical thing to you because you see it all the time. But there could be someone from Chicago who's grown up in the city their whole life that sees that image of the nature and is like, this is inspiring to me. Yeah, I need to go see that yeah. because I've never seen anything like this before. And I think that is the beauty of when you shoot nature and shoot landscapes as a photographer. You can still reach people who haven't experienced these things. and. Like, especially being a photographer that specializes in going to, I, I, I would say I still specialize in going to famous spots and shooting a really good photo there. Like, it's fun to see people that are like, where is this? I need to go there. Like, yeah. I will book a plane ticket today just to see this. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like, being a photographer is almost like, a service to other people to let them know there is immense beauty almost anywhere you go. Absolutely. You kind of just like have to find it. And if you dedicate yourself to finding it like we do, you can capture it and share it with other people. Yeah. I think that, that though can be a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, that's one of the other things that I wanted to, uh, touch on you know particularly with social media is the the impact that can have on the environment i've spoken to quite a few other uh landscape photographers and you know some of their experiences finding these once pristine places you know trampled to death and you know uh i I remember hearing somebody that i forget exactly where it was but it was somewhere in the us and you know it might might have been canada but they 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 came across you know one of these lovely places and you know whoever it was that had been there in the past had decided oh i'm not taking my tent with me i'll just leave it you know and so there's like uh, a whole tent you know yeah it you're right like it is it's tough I will say this, when I go into locations that are not kind of like mega famous, mm. uh, in Colorado, there's probably 10 spots that are just like, everyone goes to these spots to shoot. Yep. They're so known about, they're usually in national parks. So they're like, there is a bare level of protection there, but there's still so much foot traffic. There's not a lot you can do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, aside from the park like the park rangers are there to stop really bad things from happening people like climbing up trees breaking branches things like that like that doesn't happen as much because there's an aspect of people that are around whose job yeah. it is to stop that but you're right like if you do go into the back country in colorado and you take a photo and you tag the exact spot or if people ask what the spot is and you tell them it's suddenly, oh, wow, that's a really cool photo spot. They do exactly what I did. And they're like, I bet I could take a good photo yeah, there I too. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> and now they're searching for that spot in the back country. And places that used to see a thousand feet over the course of a month mm. are now seeing tens, of, if not hundreds of thousands of feet. And so the trails are getting trampled down more. People are going off trail. People are bringing trash and their waste basically Mm -hmm. and these places where oh wow i'm so lucky to have seen this it's so pristine you'll go back the next year and it's gone it's not the same yeah yeah and uh there's a couple so the responsibility is on us to uh, there's uh, i think it's on instagram it's like tag responsibly 
yep. deep, like something, something. And uh, that is, it may be cheesy, but it's like in, very important for what we do. Now, I'm not, I've, I've never been to Australia, but I'm, I've been all over the world and I'm familiar with how different countries have <laughs> better people than America. <laughs> in terms of like respect <laughs> for the environment and respect for other people uh it, do you find that a problem in australia like we do in america because that it is a, a huge issue here it can be yeah in in some places um it it depends a lot on how close it is to a big city you know some of the more remote places that uh, either going to cost you a fair amount of time or a fair amount of money to get to uh, mm -hmm. still, you know, pretty, you know, in, in pretty good condition. But, you know, let, let, let's say Airs Rock. Now, that can cost you quite a bit of time to get to and quite a bit of money if you're flying in there or, you know, mm -hmm. taking a bus or whatever. But, you know, um, one one of the other aspects of that particularly is that it's culturally significant to uh, the Aborigines and in, mm -hmm. in that area. And, you know, they've recently stopped people from climbing on it. There was, I, I forget when, but, you know, probably in the 30s or 40s, somebody that uh, went along and um, bolted in these, uh, these uh, pegs and put a chain up so that you could actually climb to the top of the rock. Mm -hmm. Perfectly natural, as it, it's flat all around it. So I want to go and stand on top of it and see the view from the top. So yeah, without thinking about the cultural significance, people, you know, over many decades were trampling up this beside this chain, and that's created its own little groove that was never there, and probably wouldn't have been there through natural erosion or anything. You know, so mm -hmm. you see some of those those, those places. That said, the management of the area around uh, Uluru, as they call it now, or Rears Rock, is has changed significantly in the last twenty years. And that land management, you know, the Aboriginals have a real say in how the land is managed. They're in mm -hmm. charge of actually running some of the businesses there around the accommodation, etc. And they've established a way that you can experience it without a you know, culturally damaging it, you know, and be mm -hmm. physically damaged, you know. And I, I think, you know, so as people become more aware of it, yes, heavily trafficked a, a place like that. But then there are other places which you can get to, you know, let, let's say, you know, southwestern Tasmania, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's very few roads in there. There's very few, um, you know, people take the time to actually hike through that, you know, wilderness. And there are, you know, there are valleys in there, which I'm pretty sure probably haven't seen more than, you know, a dozen people in the last 50 years, you know, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, they may, may or may not be particularly photogenic. I don't know because anyone who's taken a camera in there probably not tagging exactly where it is. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know, uh, I mean, it, it varies. I mean, we we have we we have idiots that you know leave their leave their trash around and uh, and whatever. I I always uh, carry a bag with me, and if I see anything, you know, I, I I try and pick it up and take it with me if it you know if I can carry it. You know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish I could say that uh, we were like more similar in those aspects. Because here in America, it we one a lot of places don't take the input or advice from the native people of the lands, and so land that was sacred to them uh, will become even in even today national parks and be a source of just like kind of turmoil in their lives because. Like, this is their land. This is where their ancestors were. And we're converting it into a tourist attraction. And there are still some places in America where 
your normal everyday person would not be able to have access. There's uh, there's actually a tribe in kind of the Grand Canyon area here in the U.S. called I uh, forgive me everyone I will mispronounce it. It's like the Havasupi, uh-huh. and uh, they have there's this waterfall and kind of riverbed area that uh, oh I think it's the Havasu people, and then the waterfall is called the Havasupi waterfall. I, uh-huh. I'm probably wrong on that, but it in order to actually trek to this place you need permission from the tribe you Mm -hmm. need to pay the tribe uh i'm not sure the full sum of money but a sum of money and then they will basically control which places you can go to around it so it's this vastly beautiful place but in order to access you need active participation from the native people of the area and but that is not the case through most of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'll find, I think it's Yosemite and Yellowstone and some of our most famous national parks were homelands to like native people that have been there for dozens of generations. Yeah. And now they're just like where we go for our Instagram photos. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, heard there's uh, also in Yosemite and uh, Yellowstone, Yellowstone in particular, ticketing for some of the, you know, the, the locations and queues of queues of people wanting to take the shot for the gram. You know. Oh yeah, uh, we haven't, there's we haven't one... quite got to that stage here, but I don't <laughs> well, think it's. I'm jealous of that. In some places, <laughs> there's a couple of spots where, uh, especially in Utah and like the Moab area. There, it's like super Instagrammable spots mm-hmm. where if you like set up a blanket and you sit on the blanket and you have the person in the shot, it's like yeah, yeah. it's beautiful as the sun rises. There are lines of a hundred people yeah. waiting to take the exact shot, and in fact, they will just reuse the blanket that other people are using <laughs> in the same shot. And that is the case in a ton of national parks. Now, I uh, want. One place that I really like to go to in Colorado, it's not a national park, but it's still protected lands, is called Maroon Lake. Yep. And then when you look over Maroon Lake, you see the Maroon Bells, which are two peaks, and it, the sun rises perfectly, hits the peaks of them. I've, I've gone, I went there dozens of times when I was out in Colorado, and it's like one of the best views you can see. But everyone has the same idea, and they, go for sunrise yeah and when you're there for sunrise some days especially on the weekend you will see 80 photographers all with their tripods like lined up right next to the water trying to get the reflection and everything and out in in recent years the water has been so low that people are stepping over the ropes boundary that is out there to protect those lands so they can just get a better reflection yeah and so it's easier when there's a lot of people there to be like for everyone to come together and be like, don't do that. Yeah. But when there when it's fewer people, it's hard for me to turn to someone and be like, be the, be don't, the... like don't step over the boundary. It, Cause it's like, in a, okay. In America, there are crazy people <laughs> who have weapons everywhere. And so it's like, am I going to be the one to say something to this guy who just might have a weapon? Yeah, and, and just going to snap at that point. Yeah. yeah, like me telling him don't go off trail is is the thing that makes him snap. And so it's like I will sit back and try to be like, oh man, I should tell him not to do that. And then I just end up not doing it. And maybe that's an irrational fear of mine. But I think it's worth thinking of like <laughs> when you're in those situations. And so um, but I think just the culture of respecting nature and everything is not there here yeah. and uh i there, there, i don't see definitely, a route yeah there, there's definitely elements here i mean the the, the gun thing's a bit less of a, a an issue though you know <laughs> they're out there um, it is a very distinctly american problem yeah. i will say yeah i mean i i remember the the the, the times i have visited the u.s being um not not shocked because I knew it was there, but you know, a little taken aback by the um, 
uh, I guess the 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 volume and the uh, openness of uh, people carrying guns around. Yeah, I've visited yeah. Te Texas a couple of times, and you know, it was kind of <laughs> a bit of an eye opener. <laughs> well, you kind of went to the breeding ground of that, so that yeah, that, that it's a little less representative of the U.S. Of the, as a whole. But uh, when you travel to a lot of like nature spots, people think like, oh, if I bring my gun, I'll be safer because of like animals and things like that. Mm. But it, I mean, I don't want to like, get on my high horse and be like bear spray is more effective than a gun. But like that is, it is. something yeah. that people <laughs> should be taught here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what, what's the furthest you've traveled to get a shot? To get one shot yeah. or just like, oh. uh, let's see here. So I did in 2019, I, what, 2019? Oh my gosh. All the years are kind of like kind of melding together. Yeah, the last two years have been like one year and five years combined. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they might, I think 2018, 2019 around there. I quit my last like corporate job until now. And uh, I went on what was basically like a 35 day road trip to Acadia National Park in Maine. Mm -hmm. And because I had this idea, like I wanted to be the first person in the US to see the sunrise on just one day. Sure. And during that time of year, the first place that the sun rises or like the sun will hit basically yep. in the United States is Acadia National Park and on Cadillac Mountain. And so uh, I was lucky and I timed out the trip for this to be on a new moon. So I was like, oh, great. I'll shoot Astro, stay in the park all night and try to be on the highest point, like standing up. I'm, I'm a decently tall person. I think I'm six foot, almost six one. So it's like if I'm on the highest point, no one else in the country <laughs> will like, will the sun hit before me? And so I went out and shot Astro that night. and. Uh, I brought like a camping chair and a blanket and I was like chilling on my phone and I like just waiting and waiting and then dozens and dozens of hundreds of other people started to show up and I was like oh no <laughs> they have the same idea like are they gonna go, try go and climb on one of their shoulders yeah <laughs> or, like is someone going to have like a ladder like I know irrational fear didn't happen but I was like did I drive across the entire country and it might not happen like what I wanted. So that's probably the longest I've gone for one. I, I did it to shoot the sunrise as well. And so I just had my camera on. Uh, oh gosh, what's the setting? It just keeps repeating, taking a photo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, So I had my camera set up to do that. So I could just immerse myself in the experience of the sunrise. Uh, and then sun, ro sun rose, people started clapping. And I was like, wow, this is like one of the best experiences of my life. And then I like stepped down from the rock I was standing on. I like get to my camera and I think I look at the photos. I'm like, this looks awful on photo. <laughs> it's, it's not a good site uh, to photograph hey. because there's no like valleys or anything. It's like, it's kind of water, but it's not like good looking water. Yeah. And so I was like, man, I drove like 2000 miles <laughs> for a bad photo but i had a good experience yeah. but uh so i did that and on that same road trip i stopped like all along places in the u.s and i actually from maine i drove down to where i'm currently living in the outer banks of north carolina and then drove back to colorado so i was on the road for like 35 days uh had to change my oil twice and <laughs> that, that's that's a big trip yeah <laughs> Yeah, do you think uh, the, I don't think I could do that again. Yeah, do you do you <laughs> think the pandemic has changed your attitude towards traveling and photography? Yeah, I actually uh, so it kind of it hurt because I was kind of hitting my stride in photography right when the pandemic was hitting. Like, I was starting to work with brands, and then COVID hit, and those offers to work with them kind of went away because they. Mm no longer needed the work and then COVID obviously lasted for a lot longer than we thought it was going to so the work that I thought might have been there for me when it 
COVID ended, it's still not there because COVID hasn't really ended. So like uh, my attitude toward it, toward photo work and personal photos has definitely changed because I think, I think of each job that I'm offered as kind of something that's more fleeting than it was before. Uh, kind of pre-pandemic, there was an abundance of work out there for good photographers. Yep. And I think it's starting to come back, but like for two years there now, it's there not a lot of companies or individuals even are really thinking I need to get photos done. Yeah. yeah. And so the business side, you have you have to look at each job and think like you, not compromise, but you're almost willing to take less than you used to just to have the opportunity to still do it for work. Sure. Um, so that that's definitely changed for me on the business side. But personally, I think a lot of my photos I took by myself anyway, even pre-pandemic. And uh, so the act of driving from my house to a location in nature and not being around other people uh, and the fact that I could still do that in the midst of the entire pandemic, like even at its worst, was a comforting factor. So if anything, photography turned into like something that I would use as an escape that to make things feel normal again, because you couldn't do almost anything else. Yeah. Uh, so I still kind of view it as this kind of solitary thing. I don't work with a ton of models or production team in my own personal work. So it still remained kind of the same. As weird as that is, like a whole pandemic didn't change my uh, personal work at all, but it's kind of true. Yeah, interesting. So about your local area now, you, you said you're in uh, is it North Carolina? Yeah. So yeah. I'm in a place called the Outer Banks. Yep. Uh, it, these it's basically, if for anyone that doesn't know, it's barrier islands that kind of protect the coast of North Carolina. And for all intents and purposes, they're just really big sandbars mm -hmm. uh, that yep. people now live on. <laughs> how, how is that influencing? You know, I, I know that you've uh, fairly recently moved there only in the last few months. Um, how does that influence how you shoot now? Well, it's definitely changed my ability to, so, okay, it's expensive to live here and mm -hmm. I'm not making like much more money than I did before. Oh. And uh, so shooting film, I've kind of uh, slowed down even more because cost is such a factor out here. Like mm -hmm. I'm on an island and the closest like, I mean, we have a Walmart that's 15, 12 miles away, something like that. Yep. So about like a 20 minute drive. But if I wanted to go clothes shopping, I would have to drive an hour and a half wow. to get to the closest area that like I could. Uh, if I, I mean, there's stores here and there, but if you want to go for a day where you visit like multiple shops, you have to drive to a yeah. bigger city. And, um, for me, that's been a big change because I lived in a city before mm. and like my whole life, I lived in Milwaukee and Denver and Detroit. And so it's like these bigger cities across America. Yeah. Where, you, and, know, you uh, had it all down the road or whatever, you know? Exactly. And so uh, I can't buy film as frequently. So I've definitely, I've started stockpiling instead mm -hmm. of like just going to get what I needed. So that's definitely changed up how I kind of source materials. And with shooting, uh, the amount, you, kind of where I've lived before, the amount of light that you get is more heavily in the evening, like just be, due to how time zones worked and where I was in those time zones, yeah. I would have more evening time and less morning time. And now I don't, like I have a ton of morning light. And no evening light, like the sun sets at 4 50 yep. p.m. right now. And uh, so I have to really rethink. Like, I used to book golden hour 
at 5 30 yeah. and now it's like golden hour starts at 3 30 3 45 and i'm just like gosh now i need to work around people's like lives because yeah. usually people are free in the evenings to do stuff so now if i'm needing to work with anyone on a shoot i need to work around these like actual schedules and pay them more than i would have because they have to leave their normal jobs yeah yeah like if i'm hiring people to help out so that's changed up that part of the shooting but also it's like the landscapes out here are flatter and kind of have different color orientations that i'm accustomed to I was saying earlier that I really like the blues and the purples and that's yeah. kind of more of a recent thing because I can see them now. Yeah. Before that, it was just dark, dark, dark sunrise. Yeah. Because things blocked out the sun before it could like breach the horizon. Yeah. And now it's like, oh no, I see the sun immediately. Yeah. And uh, so um, I would say that the landscape being flatter would has changed like how I set up for a photo, mm -hmm. um, especially a landscape shot. I try to search for high ground because a lot of the time it's so flat that like, I like a good horizon, but it's like, it's just water, or water, the horizon, then sky. There's yeah. like not a lot to yeah, work not with. Not a lot of features, yeah. Yeah. So I try to search for high ground so I can have like kind of an angle down mm -hmm. instead of, I used to shoot like straight out. Yep. And now I try to shoot like this and have like actual foreground. That's interesting. Yep. Uh, you know, in, and in Colorado, it's like, I would shoot like this. Yeah. Like, because oh, like you have the peaks out. and yeah. you're like, uh, and when you're shooting in the cities, it's like you shoot flat because you get, these big structures coming up yeah. and now it's like wow if i want to shoot anything interesting i need to be pointed down and i need to sacrifice some of the empty space of the sky yeah to have like any type of interesting shot i think you'll see in here i'm gonna actually check my instagram to make sure i'm not like <laughs> things are posted in a way that like makes sense for this but if you see like some of my more recent shots uh I try like there's more foreground than yeah. I've ever done before. Sure. And uh, I mean, it's definitely led to some, now I'm scrolling my own Instagram. I need to not do that. Uh, it's definitely led to <laughs> me trying to find subjects that I'd never thought of before. I'm doing a series right now where I, I'm calling it sunrise silhouettes. It's it kind of, I only named it that because I like alliteration and it's kind of just what makes sense in it. And it's beach shots of people or animals or anything on like walking on the beach. And because of just how the light is hitting, you only see their silhouette, but you see these big colors from the rest of the scene because like, again, the purples and the blues and the reds. And uh, so I had never experienced the ability of being like, wow, I can get, outlines of things and have the, this interesting light I, it was always just like trying to shoot the subject exposed and now i can shoot subjects unexposed and yep. have kind of this anonymity and uh so that's definitely changed since i've been out here now i would not say it's rural here but there are a lot of people like it's north carolina it's kind of the south Yep. There are a lot of people that don't take too kindly to having their photo taken. Yeah. And okay. this is a little different from like cities. People in the cities just ignore you usually like, yeah, if you're out there it. with a camera. But if you're out on the beach with a camera, people are like, did you take my picture? And I'm like, <laughs> like, like, no, I promise. Like here, I'll not, even not show deliberately. you. Like, <laughs> yeah, not on purpose. Like it, it is a picture of you, but it's not you. It is your, it is a yeah. silhouette of a person. So there's no distinguishing factor of it being you. And now it has happened to me where people have been like, can you please delete that? And I was like, sure. Uh, like, no worries. Like, I don't want to make a big deal of it. Like, I'll just take, I'll wait for the next person to start walking. 
sometimes they don't come, but I'll like, I can get the shot again. Yeah. So, yeah. but like Southern people, and I don't want to generalize too much because I've only been here a little bit, just don't like having cameras around. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so that's been a big change for me because especially yeah. like, if you go to like New York city street photography oh, is yeah. abundant. It's, yeah. It's everywhere. Like, yeah. <laughs> you'll get someone with like a 400 millimeter lens 30 feet from you. Like, yep. <laughs> and you see it pointed right at you you're like here we go like i'm probably getting my photo taken right now that's it yeah. but uh i'll walk around here with a basic like tlr film camera and people like older people will be like don't you take my photo and it's just like i wasn't even like framing anything to show that I like that I would have been taking a photo. I'm just holding the camera. Holding the camera. Yeah. But in their head, it's like their privacy is being wow. ruined. Now that might not it might not help that I'm in kind of a tourist destination. So yeah. like people are traveling from all over. But uh yeah, like that's been hugely different lately. I used to be able to set up my tripod in the city and like really frame up a shot. Mm -hmm. and no one would bother me and with now with any amount of gear even like a point and shoot people yep. will be like what are you doing over here wow <laughs> yeah i mean I, i've i've had very few experiences i actually got uh, told to move on i was doing uh, some architecture stuff here in sydney uh of last week actually i think it was and uh, a security guard came and told me i couldn't take a photo from where I was taking it. It was publicly accessible, but technically on the land that the building owned. You know, yeah. The building owner's own. So I just, uh, yeah, okay. Meanwhile, I was using my um, camera, uh, my phone as a remote. I know it not quite nailed the positioning, but it was, uh, it was okay. Yeah. So I, while I was talking to him, I was sitting there with my thumb on the, uh, the shoot button just, taking shots anyway <laughs> he wasn't in them it was it was literally a shot of the building but uh you know. i think don't we all have a story of like a random security guard oh yeah I think like, so. yeah and i've been in the situation where it's like they told me to stop taking photos but i was firmly on like public land, public land there's yeah. like there's no way this could yeah. be and it's like who are you to tell me and then but Again, I, I don't like making a fuss too much. No, nah, nor do I. No. So I'll just move on. Yeah. But it's like, man, if I could have stayed there for another like <laughs> 10 minutes, the sun would have been up perfect. Yeah. And I'd have this amazing shot. Or like you walk you walk like 100 yards away and then you see the light like just crest the horizon as yeah. you're uh, walking. You're like, oh, no. Like, yeah. I, just, yeah. I, yeah. So I know. Close. I know. I know the feeling. This, this was at night, so it wasn't wasn't that bad. The light wasn't going to change much. So, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it it still it, it still annoyed me. But uh, anyway, there's always going to be somebody uh, that's uh, you know, uh, I guess, I, uh, you know, to be honest, he probably wasn't overstepping the mark. I just thought it was a bit overzealous. But whatever. yeah, and at a certain point like we all have to realize they're just doing what their job is. That's right. They, Someone's told them to move people along if they, if they're hanging yeah. around that area too long, you know, which is fine. Yeah. And then it, but then, okay. I, when I was in Denver, I kind of involved myself into the skateboarding culture a little bit. Now I don't skateboard, but like, if you talk with skateboarders and you befriend them, like, and, going to skate parks to shoot photography is an amazing experience yeah. because it, it's such a like dynamic subjects. And a lot of skaters love having pictures done. Sure. And so uh, I like got heavily involved in the skate culture and in skate culture, like you will get shooed away in many places. So in my head, I'm like, like, Oh, but I want them to be able to stay and like fight the power and like skate where they want but in my head i'm like i don't want to make a fuss like yeah, it's not, so it's not, i'm not conflicted it. on the two yeah <laughs> it's like oh it'd be so cool like just let us stay for a while and then i 
it's like the wimp in me is like oh maybe we'll leave and like, <laughs> we'll find another place but it's like oh that place would have been perfect and then you start getting into like the ethics of uh like how far are you willing to go for the perfect yeah. spot yeah. and then i start thinking like oh man people go like this is a bad road to go down because this is how people start like stepping over the rope and exactly. going exactly and yeah. so it's like i would not call myself like a rule breaker or like a really rule follower but like i always try to think like what is that line where if i cross it i'm starting to become what i dislike yeah you don't want to be that and, person uh, you know yeah <laughs> yeah and then uh, and the thing is is that i I think also the more, uh, you know, a photographer or, you know, a number of photographers, you know, do stand their ground and start, you know, arguments and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe even escalating the situation where they, they shouldn't, you know, then that actually doesn't help the photo photographic community because, you know, photographers in general get a reputation in that person or those people's minds that you know they're they're, they're out to cause trouble you know when mm -hmm. mostly all they want to do is take a nice nice shot you know and i will say there is a certain certain genre of photography where technically what they're doing is frowned upon by the law yeah however they are doing their absolute best to leave zero trace of yep. themselves being there and i i'm more talking like urban exploration yeah i know, drift, I know the sort like, of thing you're talking about yeah yeah uh drift who's a buddy of mine uh he like climbs skyscrapers and like yep. dangles his feet off of it with shows his vans and it's like that's technically not legal but it is damn cool and it is yep. like a form of art that it might be bending the rules or breaking the rules, but like it, that is like a level of worth it. And because of how he does it, it's not like he's up there tagging graffiti on famous points or breaking ah. things or. And so I think if you have that level of, I will make sure there is no trace of me ever being here, then you can start determining like, can I bend this rule? Yeah. And I'm not at a point where I'm fully like, like my steps don't leave any mark. And like, cause I usually bring a tripod and like when you, when you use a tripod, it sometimes it digs in cause your gear is heavy. Yep. It's like, that's not leaving no trace. And uh, so I, my own work is not at that level of like the willingness to start bending the rules on it. But when I see you, other people's work where they're like finding abandoned places that you're probably not supposed to be at i yep. still view that as amazing work yeah. and i think necessary work because it's documenting these places that we would never see yeah or, or they're taking the city from an angle that you're not normally going to see like some of drift stuff i mean yeah. I, i'm i'm kind of torn with some of that stuff personally um only because you know, I mean, some of what he does, he, I think, operates fairly safely mm -hmm. because he's, you know, a, a, he's had some military training which helps him assess risk and, you know, do, yeah. do things that other people probably wouldn't normally be able to do mm -hmm. safely. And it's unfortunately the influence that that can have on people that aren't as experienced, don't understand mm -hmm. some of the risk assessments which, you know, he might be making and go and try and do some of these things. You know, it's kind of like some of those shots you see where, you know, and some some faked, some not faked, where, you know, there's people holding their girlfriend over a precipice, you know. In, yeah. <laughs> over, you know, and you kind of go... Yeah, that's just taking it one step too far. And for me, it's more, it's not so much the act that they're doing that bugs me. It's the influence that that can have on people that don't assess the risk and then end up 
fallen off a building or falling off a cliff because they haven't they haven't done that risk assessment. They don't understand yeah. involved and they're not taking safety and precautions. You know? I think that's why it's important for people who do create work like that to not show the how to. Exactly. Like, yeah. And I think Tripp does a good job. He does not show like, here's how I got in and here's how I yeah. climbed this. Yeah. He's like, final result. That is all you get to see. And that's how it is for a lot of those like abandoned building exploration people. However, sometimes you'll see a TikTok, like we hopped a fence right here. Yeah. We like yeah. we climbed to the second floor and here's, if you here's, walk, the, here's the Marauders map of how to get there. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. And uh, so I think that's the line. Like that is the line crossed. And in like artists themselves are known to be risk takers and rule breakers just throughout all of world history. And I think that shouldn't stop because of maybe certain risk, as long as the right people who are most adept are the ones taking the risk. Yeah. And so uh, when it comes to drift, like I think that work that he, he creates is important because it's good for his mental health it is therapeutic to him and just personally plus it is an incredible thing for us to look at uh so i think it's important but i like like you said at the moment people start imitating it hmm. it might become an issue and that's where the common sense of the people has to come in and be like, well, I'm not an artist. I'm not the one taking the risk. Like, I'll just enjoy this. Yeah, yeah. And so I think you can't put too much pressure on the people that are doing it to be like discouraging people from also trying it because maybe they will see the same benefit of it. But yeah, like, that, 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 that may be right. As I say, it's just a personal thing where I go, yeah, yeah. I, I look at it and oh, I, yeah. Yeah. I guess For it's me, the, the, the father in me coming out, you know, I, I wouldn't like to see my, <laughs> my children replicating that, you know. <laughs> uh, for me, when I, like, the line that I see is, uh, we know, like, base jumping, like, yeah, parachutes, yeah. and uh, I have, through, in Colorado, I became friends with some people who do that, and they are also photographers, and they will jump while holding like the harness in uh, like a camera to their chest and they'll jump, take the parachute and then try to turn themselves to get a shot that no one's gotten before. Yeah. Like, and, but they'll show the whole process. And I'm just like, man, they're, they're not telling people like, Oh, they have a thousand jumps. Uh, like already before they started taking photos doing it. Yeah. And, and so it's like, they're they're documenting it as this like incredible thing, this super fun thing, and it looks easy because they're they're so because skilled they're at experienced. it. Experienced, yeah, they've been. Yeah. Good. <laughs> and and then that opens up the ethics of like, oh, should people be parachuting here? Should like, is it is that danger worth the shot? Basically, and uh, so I think they are the extreme of that, and their stuff scared. Like that's my level of like. I don't, I don't like that because yeah. I get scared. Like that's my level of scare yeah. where I'm more concerned yeah. than anything. And uh, so, yeah, like there is definitely a line and if you're right in saying it's kind of like a personal line of where we each put that level of risk yeah. as being beneficial because of the art and like, detrimental because of the, the danger yeah 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 and I, 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 you'll never catch me doing that <laughs> yeah no no not nor my it's not my sort of thing as well i mean i i don't mind heights and whatever but yeah i'm not uh i'm not about to climb a uh, a radio mast on top of the sky <laughs> it's just oh that bit have you seen that video of i him have on yeah it? Where yeah. the drones like circling around oh my gosh i yeah. get like anxious <laughs> just thinking about that Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we're uh, we're about an hour and a half in, so we probably should. Think oh about wow. 
wrapping up soon. It's been, it's been a great chat. Have you ever yeah. hit a creative wall and how did you handle that? Oh my gosh. I'm in one literally right now because oh. I, I've been trying to do that Sunrise Silhouette series and I've, I've finished 16 of what I dedicated myself to doing 50 of. I wanted to have enough to create a book of just these silhouettes sure and i uh, i've shot a ton i probably have another 30 just like in my camera that could be turned into pieces and on film that i just haven't developed but i uh, i'm starting to think like oh are these just starting to all look the same like this are the subjects different enough to really like uh be considered like a separate pieces even like mm -hmm. obviously they're different photos taken on different days but like if they look so much alike are they really like different I, I, something I'm going through like just and I'm not sure how I will handle it I've taken two and a half weeks off of like going out during sunrise to try to capture something because I want to sit down and try to make something with what I already have. Now, uh, I think something that will help me in that is changing up how I'm shooting. I've shot most of the silhouettes with long lenses because I want people to be far away. I, I want it to kind of be compressed to a certain point. Um, and when when you're shooting with a longer lens during sunrise, like there's a greater concentration of the colors among yeah. the entire photo. Whereas if you shoot wide, you get the darkest, like it, almost black during yeah, sunrise, yeah. like in the clouds could be lit up real bright, but I don't want that. It, at least in the ones I shot, I did not want that huge spectrum. I wanted it compressed to Got it. They almost like a three color gradient yeah. instead of this like giant thing. And I think I'm going to change my thought on that. On shooting only longer lenses, I'm talking 150 to 400 ish area, um, and maybe try to shoot stuff at 80 or even wider. Uh, I don't think I'm ready to go full into like 16 millimeter yep. or anything like that. Uh, but like maybe if I the later pieces just include more of the spectrum and are just a little wider. I shoot most of them vertically because I'm dumb <laughs> because I'm shooting <laughs> stuff for so like, it, it kind of sucks to shoot it. Like to say you're shooting it for social media, but I'm shooting it to share with other people. Sure. And uh, it's led me to avoid a landscape style while yeah. I'm doing these because I've shot a couple of landscape styles and I thought wow this is a really great solo photo but it doesn't fit the series because it like because it is wider the subject the silhouette does not take as much space in the shot sure, sure. and so or at least horizontal space yeah and I uh, so like that's been severely limiting in terms of like what I can capture because sometimes the scene is just better landscape than it is portrait. Yeah. And uh, so I think maybe just what I will try to do is reevaluate the limitations I've set for myself. Mm -hmm. So I could continue doing the series that I'm really interested in doing, but not feel like I'm constricted in it. So it's definitely something I'm working on. And before this, I never understood when photographers were saying that they were stuck on something. Yeah. I never under, like, I had never experienced that, when, which, like, thank God, like, because I, I never knew how bad it could be. Yeah, I would exactly. see people tweet out like, oh, I'm just not feeling my art lately. And I was like, what are you talking about? Art's great. Like, why, <laughs> so, like, why would you ever not feel it? And now it's like, oh my gosh, when you actually try to sit down and like do one thing for a while, it starts to become a burden and you just need to 
I need to find a way to make it not burdensome. Yeah, need, so, to, need, need to break out. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, some, some people do it by taking a break. Some people, you know, go and shoot something different, you know, or, or take a break from Project X and do, you know, maybe even start another project. I've, I've done that a few times and, you know, I've, I've got a couple of unfinished projects which, you know, I, I want to get back into but just never found the motivation to get back into. You know? <laughs> do you ever just look at those older photos and be like, wow, that was really cool. Yeah. Why did I stop that? And then yeah. you start thinking more on it. And you're like, oh, no, that's why I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. So are there any photographers out there that you think I should be talking to? I uh, So I'll give you a couple in the film world mm -hmm. and then maybe one or two kind of in the digital space. Cool. Um, if we're looking into the digital space specifically, uh, I think that, um, oh gosh, what is there at? Oh, everyone I know in the <laughs> photo world outside of like my personal friends are from social media. So uh, I need to remember what they're here. I will, <laughs> I will find their at. Oh. Yeah. Uh, in the film world, there's, uh, his name's Sam on Twitter. Uh, it is... His at is knife maker guy. He used to make yeah. knives. Um, he is big into like most of what he shoots is film and he does infrared photography as well okay. as uh, um, one of his main kind of facets. Um, and he is from Indiana mm -hmm. and he lives in South Carolina now. Okay. So, uh, and he does a lot of like, rural street i would say like if that does that, yeah, no. of, does that is it a style i i think it is yeah i, I think i get what you mean yeah sort of like your your, your uh small town you know yeah uh, yeah and some people call i really it like the that. yeah the the, the, yeah. the lonely service station or the the, the lonely shop store that's you know beside a dusty road or whatever you know definitely um and then Oh gosh, I don't know if he's actually film. <gasps> I should have. Well, Sean Murphy uh -huh. is uh, another photographer um, who I think has a like a style that I really I look at and I think like, oh, I wish I had shot stuff like that. Um, but I, it's just not my like forte. Yeah, like I wouldn't be good at it. So. Um, those two um you probably know daniel daniel stagner yeah from, uh, he, he, he's that, on my list yeah <laughs> yeah big big landscape photographer guy yep. uh let's see here i've been hanging around a lot of portrait photographers so like i uh, my knowledge of the landscape world is not as strong anymore um do you know Eamon? E A M O N. I don't think I do. He's been doing a lot of uh, um, 35 millimeter film from around like the American West and um, kind of so certain parts of Europe as well. Uh, so he makes some incredible stuff. And then uh, also in the film world is. Um, his name is Nate Sanchez on Twitter. I think it's just at San or Sanch. Yep. And he's been doing some uh, nighttime long exposure film work. That's just like really impressed me lately. Um, so yeah, those are some people that I, they might not be like famous people or anything, but I, I draw like inspiration from them. Uh, right. I'm not a at not Darren, just famous people. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at Darren Films or Darren's Film or something like that is another film person who I, he's also from the Midwest. So, it kind of, uh, his name's at Dixon underscore bots. Um, but he does almost exclusively film work. 
And I kind of have this obsession with like middle America yep. when it comes to work that I like to look at because it's so different from what I shoot personally. Sure. You know, I shoot mountains and coast and cities. But yeah, you're saying like the banal look of just like yeah, ordinary a town. Yeah, ordinary town or street scenes or things, you know, or, or a house, you know. <laughs> yeah, I would say that type of work makes me think about art more than like a typical landscape photo would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That grand, you know, vista that you know everybody says, "Oh, that's a that's an amazing looking place," as compared to mm-hmm. you know, a house. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, a, a close friend of mine who is like in the landscape world, um, let me bring up his Twitter real quick. Um, I met up with him in Western North Carolina where he lives. He's like a big mountain guy. Um, his name is Photo Fern. Fern yep. is his, um, and he primarily shoots digital but he inherited a film camera from his grandfather and has started to shoot some of the same stuff like he'll do the same shot on film and on digital and i love to see like the compare comparisons between uh the two mostly because like i most time i dedicate myself to either shooting film or digital Mm -hmm. just because it's kind of cumbersome to yeah. walk around Man- with... managing multiple cameras in multiple formats is uh, a challenge yeah. I know. <laughs> when i shoot digital i already carry two bodies with one with a long lens and one with a wide lens yeah and uh as soon as you, i'm like oh i'll shoot film too it's like oh where do i put it like yeah. where do, I, do i have <laughs> three camera straps like film in the middle and digital on the sides or something and uh plus film cameras are just like enormously heavy sometimes so it's like yeah, yeah. particularly <laughs> the medium format yeah yeah i've been uh i rented um a couple of different medium formats from there's this local photographer old guy like he is retired and he but he doesn't want to sell any of his stuff so i'm like well can i rent it from you and he's like well how much i was like oh, i'll give you 50 dollars for the weekend to rent this and so I took out like his Pentax 67. He had like a, a Mamiya RZ 67. And like these things are tanks. This is like heavy metal. Yep. And it's like you, you put it around your neck and you, you're like leaning forward <laughs> as you walk because it's just so hefty. And uh, he has this like wooden grip on his Pentax. And it's like in order to shoot the camera, you're like this. Wow. And it's like, I'm not a small guy. And I feel like this camera is just huge. <laughs> and like you you're holding it up to your eye looking through the viewfinder and your arms are getting tired and you can like feel the camera start to drift down and it's like holy cow people used to use these as like their main camera yeah and meanwhile a mirrorless camera nowadays it's like oh yeah this weighs half a pound and the so, lens is actually four times its weight <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. All right, well, I've got one last and probably for most of the listeners, the most important question. Do you like pineapple on pizza? I love pineapple on pizza. I think it is a great addition to a pizza, especially if there's Canadian bacon on it. Uh, I think it's underrated. And I think people who don't like it need to stick to the kids menu. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's good to find somebody with a firm opinion on it <laughs> yeah no, i don't like to waver on my uh pineapple on pizza opinion uh, I, I gotta stick in confidence with it because otherwise people will make fun of me <laughs> <laughs> oh, well it, it has been absolutely wonderful uh chatting to you uh slater i've uh really enjoyed catching up with you and um it's been amazing you know uh, hearing yeah. about some of your journey and uh, so forth. Where can people find your stuff? So I'm at Slater Lemley on every social media. Uh, don't go to my website because I haven't updated it in a year. So uh, <laughs> if you if you find my website at all, it's just it's not representative of what I'm currently doing. 
Um, so Twitter and Instagram are probably the best spots. Fair enough. All right. Well, thanks very much, Matt. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope that, uh, like I I've been listening to a couple of episodes of recent and I hope this kind of keeps going for you and it becomes, uh, a big thing for you. Or if you don't want it to be a big thing, that's fine. But, uh, I think it's a kind of a great concept too to interview people who might not be like famous photographers because there's good insight into kind of what they shoot and why they shoot yeah well for for me i just have a fascination you know and it, it helps me in my own creative thinking as well but i have a fascination for hearing about how people do what they do and why they do what they do in particular, you know, Mm -hmm. I I, I just find it uh, really interesting. And uh, I mean, I started this back uh, when we were in a uh, a very severe lockdown uh, here in Sydney where I couldn't go out and take photos. So it was all, it was all about, okay, so what, what do I do? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah so i started this and uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it going for as long as i can keep motivated at it and as long as i can find interesting people to talk to and i haven't had a problem finding interesting people to talk to so far so which has been yeah great. and i'm sure there's probably tons of people who are like this is what they've been searching for something to kind of release what they've been thinking about yeah for yeah. during that time yeah all right. Well, thanks, mate. I'll uh, yeah. I'll I'll certainly uh, look up some of your um your recommendations and see if we can get them on uh, in the future sometime. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I'll make sure to get you the uh, photos or video or whatever you were. Yeah. No worries. For. Thank you. Awesome, Grant. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work and this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Grant Swinburne and hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm-hmm.